We all know the Beatles were a massively influential band who contributed to changes in music and culture in countless ways. Do you want to find out how the Beatles changed the music world? Then hop along with us on this dedicated channel. Make sure to like the video, hit subscribe and that bell notification as we tackle all things Beatles with new videos every week. It's almost trite to talk about how much the Beatles change music, western popular culture and basically the entire world. Certainly, it was the combination of their incredible talent and being in the right place at the right time with the right people that launched them into their immense stardom. As the society appointed standard bearers of rock and roll music, their every move was highly scrutinized and the Beatles never disappointed. Always looking to stretch their own capabilities and carve out new and interesting sonic territory, their position as pioneers meant they were operating mostly without a roadmap and creating via experimentation and their own internal compasses. The Beatles and their audio team ended up inventing recording techniques and ways of achieving sounds that were copied and are still used by recording artists today. Here are areas where the Beatles blazed their trail through the rock wilderness for others to follow. The Flanger While the artificial double tracking effect popularly known as the Flanger was invented by Les Paul in his garage and used on his tune Mammy's Boogie in 1952, it was the Beatles who named it and proud of their creation used it all over 1966 Revolver bringing it into the permanent sonic vocabulary. Different authors have narrated different creation stories for the word. One story has it that John Lennon, who always hated the sound of his own voice, would ask for effects to be put on his vocal tracks. He'd say to George Martin, I don't know, change it somehow, smother tomato ketchup all over it, flange it. The other, possibly less apocryphal story involved the invention of the technology itself. By Revolver, the Beatles had begun double tracking most of their vocals and constantly having to sing the same track twice was wearing on them. To help them out, EMI engineer Ken Townsend came up with the idea of artificial double tracking, ADT. In ADT, a signal from a tape could be fed into another tape machine with a variable oscillator to allow for speed alteration and then laid over the first signal but separated slightly in time so as to thicken the sound. Thus, the Beatles would only have to sing the track once and could have all the benefits of double tracking for half the work. Lennon asked how this technology worked and Martin apparently answered goofily, Now listen, it's very simple. We take the original image and we split it through a double fabricated sploshing flange with double negative feedback. From then on, when John would want the effect, he'd ask for flanging or Ken's flanger. Post Revolver, the effect was used on the Small Faces Itchy Koo Park and in stereo for the first time on most of Jimi Hendrix's Electric Lady Land. The first rack mounted flanger effects appeared in the 1970s with solid state technology and the rest is history. Both the effect and its name would have never reached the wider world without the Beatles. Microphone Creativity Jeff Emmerich was the Beatles' assistant engineer and from Revolver onwards their chief engineer. He obviously received many outlandish demands from them, which being young and adventurous, he was only too happy to try to fulfill. One of the first demands involved putting a mic into a condom and suspending it in milk for Yellow Submarine, which could have electrocuted Lennon. Thankfully, it did not, though the contraption had to be hidden when EMI chairman Sir Joseph Lockwood made a surprise visit to the studio. Near-death risks notwithstanding, Emmerich began to experiment with the group in an attempt to capture different kinds of sounds. Nobody before him had closed mic instruments at EMI. In fact, it was strictly against the rules. Most EMI engineers in the 1960s wore lab coats and had a code of conduct with the equipment. Pioneers of irreverence as well as sound, the Beatles were well served by the like-minded Emmerich. Their fame and importance to EMI meant that Emmerich did not get fired for his transgressions and was allowed to keep abusing the microphones. And he did. Close miking guitars, vocals, sitars, brass strings and every other instrument imaginable. Emmerich's creativity extended to the miking of the drums in particular. Before the Beatles drums were generally recorded by two mics, one on the kick drum and one overhead above the snare. Emmerich mic'd each drum individually and added one underneath the snare. He convinced Ringo Starr to put tea towels across his drums to dampen the ring from the metal edges, one of the keys to the Abbey Road drum sound. He also stuffed a sweater inside the kick drum, a routine and common recording practice today. One of Emmerich's biggest pet peeves was the fact that due to EMI's paranoia about needles jumping on cheap record players, much of the bass was taken off the early Beatles records. The EMI maintenance department invented a process introduced during record cutting called Automatic Transient Overload Control ATOC. 
This allowed for extra bass on a record without fear of stylus problems. Wanting a massive bass sound on paperback writer, Emmerich and Paul McCartney actually turned a loudspeaker into a microphone and placed it in front of a bass amp for an extra boost. It was Emmerich's idea to run Lennon's vocals for Tomorrow Never Knows through a rotating Leslie speaker to help creating the feeling Lennon wanted of shouting from a mountaintop. Indeed, often it was Emmerich's zany experiments with microphones or mic placement that helped drive the tracks forward. He was then able to harness the tools at his disposal on the recording consoles, EQ and compression to shape the sounds further. Without him being a willing accomplice, the Beatles might not have pushed the envelope nearly as far as they did. Tape Creativity Working in the malleable medium of recording tape allowed the Beatles another layer of experimentation, as physical tape can be stretched, reversed, pulled on and spliced. Tape loops were not a new concept, they were already explored by various experimental composers like Terry Riley and Karl Heinz Stockhausen. The Beatles were very familiar with these avant-garde composers, as most creators were in the heyday of swinging London. Always eager to pursue their own devil-may-care bansai creative urges, their fascination with experimental sounds was the primary driver of their innovations with magnetic tape. The closest the Beatles came to being electronic composers was in the use of tape loops on Tomorrow Never Knows, being for the benefit of Mr. Kite, the avant-garde Revolution 9, Tomorrow Never Knows was a cavalcade of tape loops played live during the mix on five different tape machines scattered throughout the MI complex. The loops consisted of found sounds, odd noises like Paul laughing backward, and different notes being played on the Mellotron and sitar. The loops on Mr. Kite were all organ and calliope noises from the EMI sound library. Martin had Emmerich toss the bits of tape into the air and then reassemble them from the pile on the ground. Revolution 9 is only loops, Lennon, Yoko Ono and George Harrison's explorations into the realm of Stockhausen and John Cage. The idea for backward vocals came from Lennon accidentally putting on a working master tape for Rain upside down on his home tape player. From that point forward, the Beatles insisted on every overdub being tried both forwards and backward, resulting in the backward guitar solo on I'm Only Sleeping, the backward vocals on Rain, and the backward drums on Strawberry Fields Forever. Reverse tape effects became a crucial part of the psychedelic sound library and were used by almost every recording artist from that point forward. Again, while the Beatles did not invent the technique itself, they made these innovative and experimental methods accessible to everyone through their incorporation into their pop songs. Music Video 17 years before MTV unleashed itself on the airwaves, the Beatles starred in their first major motion picture, A Hard Day's Night in 1964. Some of the key musical sequences were presented as silent drama under the Beatles recorded tracks, a precursor to the format that music videos would follow in subsequent generations. Rhythmic cross-cutting and contrasting long shots and close-ups were used to give unity between the film and the music. The director Richard Lester often joked in later years that people called him the father of MTV, and he jokingly responded by asking for a paternity test. The Beatles' second film, Help, took the music video concept to another level, this time in colour as Lester employed even more unusual and daring camera angles and focused choices. After the Beatles retired from live performance, they began making promotional videos to send to TV shows like Ed Sullivan. As their music and lifestyles became more psychedelic, so did their videos. The promo clips for Strawberry Fields Forever and Penny Lane used slow motion, reverse film, exaggerated lighting and camera movements, and colour filters often employed by underground filmmakers. They took their filmic experimenting to the limits with a full-length feature Magical Mystery Tour, which mostly mystified critics and audiences with its mostly incomprehensible plot, improvised script and abstract music video segments. However, viewed through today's lens, scenes like The Fool on the Hill and I'm the Walrus are fairly straightforward music videos. Unlike Elvis Presley, who starred in movies with a script and a linear story, the Beatles movies were mostly music first and plot second. The music video sequences and creative direction by Lester were a new thing for audiences. Mostly, it showed other bands and artists the possibility that they too could make these videos, and many did. It wasn't until the advent of MTV that the standalone music videos became a common tool in a band toolbox, so it's impressive how far ahead the Beatles were in this respect. Like most of their innovations, it was born from a willingness to try new things combined with their particular needs at that particular time. There you have it all guys, drop a thumb up in the comment section. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe buttons if you've not done that, and follow us on Instagram and Twitter. The handles are in the description box below.